So my interest in medicines uh, came from a family with ill health. My father developed chronic renal failure when I was um, about 11 or 12. And that's what prompted me to go to uh, apply for medical school. Or to start working to get the right grades to go to medical school. <laughs> my interest in the brain, uh, I think it was the mystique attached to the brain at the time. Uh, even now, very little is known about the brain. And it is the big frontier in medicine. So the brain was very challenging. And it was also very interesting in a way. It was a, of all the specialties, it's, I think, the most technically or intellectually demanding spe specialty, which is why I decided to do neurology. I always say this to my children. I've got two daughters who are now 10 and 14. Is the biggest privilege in life is being able to work in a job that you enjoy. But what keeps us, what keeps me d uh, driven is the uh, belief that we can make a big difference in MS. <laughs> so what I do in a week, so every Tuesday morning, neuroinflammatory clinic. My other clinic's on a Friday morning, multiple sclerosis. In between that, then I also do trial work in the trial unit. I do ward rounds, because I often get a lot of email at least two or three hours. Monday morning and a Wednesday morning for blood results, doing the administration of trials. Either seeing patients, phone calls, my um, research, half days or full days or two or three days. And I just don't have time to do that have regular meetings with them. I'm also the center lead. I run the Neuroscience and Trauma Center, filling in forms for HR, being on interview panels, doing appraisals, performance management. I have to write articles, I have to write grants, I have to do email. I must spend about four to six hours of emails. I do my emails mainly in the evening, usually start at about 10 o'clock at night doing emails. The other thing that's taking a lot of my time now is training for the London Marathon. So yesterday um, I did a 19 mile run part of the training. Um, I usually am much fitter than this for a marathon. So this is going to be a touch and, a touch and go marathon. So um, if you listen into this, sponsor me. Uh, that you can, you can find the uh, link on um, uh, just give Um, there is a bit of a serious part of this day and um, I'd like to say that the, the reason why we have this day is that we've been given a brief to engage the public in science. Um, the brief really comes from, there's been a shift in the emphasis funding agencies, not, I call them the funding agencies, these are the people that fund our research. Um, they now expect us to engage the public in science, and particularly the people who uh, in relation to multiple sclerosis. So um, we did, this is why we launched our first day, and we're going to be doing this on an annual basis. And I think there's, um, there's a good reason for doing that is because we have the opportunity to communicate our research to you and allow you to interact with us. Um, from a personal perspective, it also helps team building because all the people involved in our group come here today. And it also allows you to give us some ideas about the type of re, uh, research you want to do. It also means it's not a one-way street, and I'll go through this. In other words, uh, the previous model was the scientists thought of all the ideas, did all the research, published them, and just expected the public to adopt that. And it doesn't work like that. Um, you have to see what's happened with climate science uh, in the last uh, 18 to 24 months, how the public have uh, reacted to uh, climate science researchers. And I think they're to blame. They should have engaged the public a lot more uh, earlier with their work but rather than kept it secret. So there has to be this transparency model. So the model is, it's not a, it's, there is an entry zone and we have to make it a two-way street. It's not only scientists and clinicians doing research, but we have to engage the people with, uh, uh, who've got the disease and their stakeholders with our research. The other thing is we need you. A lot of our research is not just on animal models, but it requires research on people with MS. And if people with MS understand why we're doing the research, they're much more likely to participate. And we were probably one of the biggest clinical trial units in the country. We have over 100 people there MS on various clinical trials, and you hear about that. The Giles, I've just seen you gave me a text, the Giles arrived. Uh, he's over there because he was lost. <laughs> so Giles is going to summarize some of the, the, the emerging therapies uh, and around our trial unit, the trials we're involved in. 
Another important thing, and you're going to hear a lot about it today, is um, we set up a, an issue, we set up a, uh, a, well, before I get to that, this is the kind of application form, by the way, we have to fill in when we get money from the MS Society. If you want to get it to search, we have to make a, put a grant application in, and on every single, on every single grant application now, there's a section saying involvement of people affected by MS, and we have to give them a reason, and give them, tell them how we uh, get involved with MS. So now what we can do is, we were fully in that. We say we, we have an MS research day and we have a whole lot of initiatives to engage the people with MS, so we take it quite seriously. One of the things that we did as part of this, and I'm not sure if you follow this, is we started a research blog where we publish every now and again various topics that are important, I think, for people with MS. And this particular blog is not for scientists, it's for people with MS and their families to, to keep up to date with what I think are important uh, innovations that have been published or coming to the fore around the, the disease. For example, new drug target to promote remyelination. This is an old slide. How much vitamin D is too much? These types of questions we get asked all the time. It also helps us in clinic because we can refer people to the blog rather than have to spend hours going through the same issues um, uh, as well. I'd like to show you some little correspondence. And the good thing about a blog is interactive. So. Um, I don't think it should be political, but we made it political. Uh, in, in September, Vince Cable came and gave a talk at our institution about um, the potential budget cuts to science. Okay, and I, I apologise for politicising the blog. Um, apologies about politicising this blog, but what happens to investment in science in the UK will eventually impact on the lives of people with MS and their families, because we depend on research funds to do research. The only way to limit the impact of this devastating disease is through scientific research. The unmet need in MS is massive, and I list what I thought the unmet need is. Okay, and when I said, without investment in research, how, how are we going to address these needs? You may find Vince Cable's speech interesting, and I gave a link to his speech, which is still available on the internet. And I got quite an interesting feedback. So there was a comment. When I read your comments, I realize how little has actually been achieved for MS sufferers given the research into the disease has been going on for 50 years. I don't agree with that because I think a lot's happened uh, in MS research in the last 50 years and we've really advanced the, the field. Okay, but at least it provides opportunity to respond to that. Somebody said, the trouble with MS research is that there seems to be no connection with the amount of money spent and the results achieved. Millions have been spent on some initiatives, for example, the United States MS Society's Promise 2010. And we were one of the groups funded by Promise 2010. The fundraising has always promises huge advances in treatments, etc., but they never materialize. With investment to date, very little has really happened. For example, no treatment for people with progressive MS. The question shouldn't be why there isn't more funding, but why so little has been achieved with the huge investments already made. And we will show you today some of the advances we've made with the research that's been funded by Promise 2010, and hopefully convince you that something has happened. And then there's some, but this, this is, this, this is the, the one that really um, was very, very interesting. Academics and researchers who, who are judged on the number of peer-reviewed articles or presentations at international conferences, they often rely on funding from the drug companies that are not going to bite the hand that feeds them. And this, and this is a career. Many MS academics, that's me, and that's all of us, uh, and, uh, uh, slash researchers have been researching MS for 20 plus years, implying that we really need to continue this research to keep our careers going. Um, it's a bit of a cynical attitude, but what you've got to realize, and I was just discussing with somebody this after, uh, uh, is Ian, who just to ask questions about it, is that we didn't create the pharmaceutical monster. Um, the monster's there because it's just too expensive for academic institutions to develop drugs. We just do not have the resources. So we have to do this with pharmaceutical companies. There's no, uh, so we have to interact with pharmaceutical companies. If we want to develop drugs for people with MS, we have to follow the model that's out there. We cannot do it. The costs are far too high for, for academics within the NHS to do the kind of trials and development work to develop drugs for MS. And then this one, uh, as someone with MS, I know the unmet need is massive. It's a pity that researchers can't focus on one aspect, uh, for example, progression and solve it as quickly as possible. And we are. We as a group are focusing on progression and we'll discuss some of the, the work we're doing today. And then somebody just said thanks for sharing, which is a, a nice comment. So the key questions that um, we need to address is, in terms of research is the kind of questions that people always ask us is, can we cure the disease? And if we can't cure the disease, can you make me better? Can you improve the symptoms, stop me getting worse? And can you restore my lost function? And we will try and discuss all those issues today about possible, can we cure the disease? 
what are we doing for symptoms, uh, and can we stop the disease getting worse? And then the, the, the one that really gets, the, the, what, most people, a lot of people with MS don't realize this, but uh, MS is familial in the sense that children of uh, parents who've got the disease are at a higher risk of getting the disease. And we begin to understand a lot about the, uh, the, the risks uh, attached to getting the disease. And one of our major research projects that we're launching is, a, is to try and prevent this disease. But before we can prevent this disease, we've got to predict this disease. And you'll hear some of the work that's been going on, uh, developing in terms of uh, prediction and hopefully eventually prevention. And one of the things that Maria said to me I cannot talk about, nobody can talk about, is death and dying. And I, and I say no, because although a lot of this today is going to be fun and enjoyable, there is a serious, serious aspect to this disease. And this is a serious aspect. This is a, um, a study that we did uh, uh, to try and get the drug Tysabri, natalizumab licensed in the United Kingdom. We had to show NICE that this drug was cost effective. And we went out to the population and did a, a survey asking them about how they interpret the quality of life of people with the disease. Now this particular index here is a health economy index called utility. Just to explain, a utility is basically quality of life. And if you've got a utility of one, your quality of life is perfect. And if you've got a utility of zero, your quality of life it doesn't exist because zero is death. So anybody who's got a utility score above uh, zero, okay, has a reasonable or has quality of life. What's important though, people with very severe disability, and this is the scale we use, the EDSS scale, that we use often, uh, just to give you, just to orientate you, the EDSS six is when you need a walking stick, and EDSS seven is when you need a wheelchair. EDSS 8 is when you're beginning to develop weakness in the upper limbs, and EDSS 9 is essentially when you're bed bound. So this is severe disability. Society actually rated people like that as having a quality of life worse than death. There is no other disease that scored zero, negative scores. MS is the only disease that scores negatively. So we have to actually realize that, uh, you know, in the pre the disease modifying therapy era, uh, when people get to this stage, society considers their life as being worse than death. So there is this issue that we can't ignore. And this is the whole purpose of our research, is to try and prevent people from ending up uh, in that, uh, that state. The other thing is uh, society, I think, perception of this disease is very negative. And uh, you only have to work in an MS clinic to see the, uh, Simon's response, for example, when diagnosed is how uh, society perceives multiple sclerosis. And this is, uh, Madeline, uh, this is Jacqueline Dupre, a famous cellist who died in her 40s from severe MS. So people get to understand these celebrity MSs, as we call them, and they begin to think this is a terrible, terrible uh, disease. And then it doesn't help when you get these stories in the press. Uh, Debbie Purdy, you all followed the Debbie Purdy case? So Debbie Purdy's got primary progressive MS, and she's gone to the High Court. She's gone to, uh, to well, we call it now, it's almost the Supreme Court, but she's the law lords judged that um, if her partner goes with her to Dignitas in Zurich in Switzerland for assisted suicide, when he comes back, he won't be arrested or charged for manslaughter. So she's, they've set the precedent, um, but what it has done is it's actually made people think in the public that MS is a terminal illness, and it's not a terminal illness. So we have to deal with all those issues. And we actually haven't really had to focus on MS being a terminal illness or the death issue until this particular story hit. And some of you may have ignored it, but not everybody ignores it. So what we have done is We've actually launched a, uh, a web survey to try and uh, address what the needs are for people with MS and their families. It's taken us a whole year to get ethics for this, by the way. It's bounced backwards and forwards about 20 times. So Morag, I don't think Morag's here today, uh, but Morag's leading on this. And it's a joint project between us and the MS Society. And it's a five-minute survey um, just to get the people's attitudes and how we should incorporate the people's attitudes into our, uh, our MS service. So uh, if you can, I would appreciate it if you could log in and, and do the survey. And there, there, there is potential counselling if people find some of the issues, um, uh, and, uh, to discuss some of the issues. And then a great uh, success has been um, our involvement with uh, Shift MS. Now Shift MS is a wonderful initiative. This is uh, how people should act. This is basically taking MS and modernising it. One of the problems with um, the MS Society, the MS Trust, etc., is they have to they have to uh, design 
uh, uh, web, web resources and reading material for the whole population. <clears throat> George Pepper, who has multiple sclerosis, didn't like, developed multiple sclerosis with, when he was in uh, university and his friend Freddie. They didn't like um, the, the uh, well, they didn't say they didn't like it, but they felt that they weren't addressing their needs as somebody young with MS. So they actually uh, started Shift MS, and the purpose of Shift MS is to uh, create a web resource for young people with multiple sclerosis and to incorporate uh, uh, what I would call new technologies like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, etc. And um, they came to us two or three years ago, and we put a grant application into the Wellcome Trust. And the Wellcome Trust just given us a grant, a okay, People Award, to actually um, uh, make our research or make research accessible to people with uh, young people with MS or people with MS in, a more, in an easier way. Okay, so we're about to launch, and you will hear later on in the day about the Shift MS initiative or the Research MS initiative, and I think it's very, very exciting. So, are there any tweeters out there? Somebody waving a hand. Well, you can tweet today if you want. Uh, there's a you know hash. It's called Bart's Research Day, and it'll go on to Twitter. So Becky's at the back, and she set this up. So if you want to tweet, hash Bart's Research Day. Anything you want about about today, and then. Um, before we get on with the proceedings for today, I'd really like to thank all our sponsors. And I can't mention them uh, all uh, in detail, but they are big ones and they are small ones. And these are the organizations that fund our research. And I have to particularly thank the Multiple Sclerosis Society, United Kingdom and Great Britain, and the National MS Society, who funded our large Promise 2010, Aims to Cure, who have been uh, supported us now for almost 10 years, and uh, the, 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 M the MRC, and then we've got a large number of uh, collaborations with uh, industrial companies, mainly to do clinical trials and new novel agents for people with multiple sclerosis. So we wouldn't be here today talking to you about the research we do at Barts in the London uh, without our, our funding organisations. And then these things don't happen without having to spend money. So um, I'd like to thank, and we've, we've had generous sponsorship from uh, industry for today. I'd like to thank Bayer, Healthcare, Biogenidec, Merck Serona, uh, Novartis, and Genzyme for uh, kindly uh, funding or sponsoring uh, 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 today. Just to say to you, I have to acknowledge these companies, but they have no input at all into what we talk about today. This is um, what we'd call educational grants, and the agenda is all set by us if you want to... Uh, and then I just have to thank Maria. This is Maria in her... I, I, I gave her the task of organizing today, and I said to her, I don't want to know too much about it. My life's busy enough as it is. And uh, we go away and organize the day, and she's gone away and organized the day. So this is all up to Maria, and I'd like to thank Maria very much. We can give a round of applause to help you.